What emotion do you feel when you're going to approach someone you're very attracted to and there's an extremely high probability that she's going to tell you to disappear? Real judgment, it's like the best judgment is, well, I don't mind your physical presence, but your genes should definitely not survive another generation. <laughs> right, and that's sort of generally translated into, I think we should just be friends. <laughs> right, you know, and you can blow that off, and people do, and you have to, because it's part of being polite and civilized, but, you know, let's make no mistake about it. There is no more fundamental judgment than that. Paralysis and there's no shortage of men. I mean who are absolutely terrified of women I mean I've had many of them in my practice, you know I had one guy he was so terrified of women. He couldn't even talk to them on the phone. It's more common than you think So but it's generally manifested by men who do who no one cares about so it's generally irrelevant so Well, it's the it's the case. It really is the case. I'm, I'm not kidding. They're low-status men you know, they're people that are generally regarded as losers and there isn't anybody who really gives a damn about what happens to them one way or another. And there's a lot more men in that category than there are women. Well, women are in all sorts of, you know, social categories that cause them misery and distress, but that one seems to be predominantly male. One of the things I'm going to do when we talk about Freud is I'm going to show you this movie Crumb, which I just told you about. And it, it's actually, it's a very rare thing because it shows you the world from the perspective of very intelligent male losers. And that's just not a perspective you ever see because it's the winners that tell the stories about their life. It's like who the hell cares about the life of a loser. But this movie is about a loser who became a winner and, you know, almost as an act of revenge. And, uh, it's great, it's great, great, great uh, examination of the Oedipal complex. Remarkable. Women select men. That makes them nature. Because nature is what selects. And so, you know, you can say, well, it's only symbolic that women are nature. It's like, no, it's not just symbolic. It's not just symbolic. You know, and the woman, in some sense, is the gatekeeper to rep is, not in some sense, is the gatekeeper to reproductive success. And you can't get more like nature than that. In fact, it's the very definition of nature. If you think about the world in Darwinian terms, right, it's a struggle for survival and reproduction, which are basically the same thing. Survival is you, but reproduction is the survival of your genes. So it's a, it's a survival issue over very long spans of time. Okay. What do we call the selection mechanism? Yeah, right, natural selection, right? It's nature who does the selection. Okay, so let me tell you something that makes female humans different than female chimps. I mean, there's lots of things that, that do, but... <laughs> so, but here, here's an important one. If you look at which male in a, female, in a chimp troop fathers most of the offspring, it's the dominant male. But the reason for that isn't because the female chimps sort of flock around the dominant male. Now that happens in other species, but it doesn't happen with chimps. What happens is the dominant male chases all the subordinate males away and will interfere with any sexual behavior they manifest. It'll chase them away. The females, though, are perfectly happy to mate with a subordinate male if they're in heat and they get the opportunity. So they go into heat, which is something that doesn't happen with female humans, and they really don't care who they mate with. Okay. Female humans are much different than that. They're picky. So they're, they're are really, they're choosy. It's a big deal. It's a big deal that they're choosy. As women also seem to evaluate men for their fitness. Now, so, lots of men have no sexual partners and they have no children. That's not the case with women. Almost all women have one child or more. And it's a rare woman indeed who cannot find a sexual partner. So it's more or less a truism that if you take a male dominance hierarchy, the probability that the men at the top of the hierarchy will leave offspring is much higher than the probability that the men at the bottom will leave offspring. And it's true in many, many species. Now there's a much higher probability of the average female leaving offspring than the average man. So, so now then imagine that there's characteristics that push a man up a dominance hierarchy. Okay, and then imagine that there are characteristics that push a man up a set of dominance hierarchies. So that each dominance hierarchy has something in common with all of the others. It's sort of like the idea of a, of a good player of a game being a good sport across games. So then imagine that 
the idea of the successful male starts to become encapsulated in, in, in biology because the species is going to, the male part of the species at least, is going to be adapting to the selection pressures placed on the male by the male dominance hierarchy. So what happens is you have a competition between men. The men that win the competition find partners and mate. So the, the, the male is going to start to adapt to the fact of the selection that's implemented by the dominance hierarchy. Then you can imagine that that's going to take, case, take place across dominance hierarchies because this is happening in many, many situations spread across time. And so then the idea of how the proper man should act starts to become incorporated in the biology and also in the expectations of the society. And then that starts to loop. So as the expectations become clearer and clearer, the notion of what it constitutes success becomes clearer and clearer as well. And the two things get tangled together. Now, and I, th I think you can see that a manifestation of that whenever you go watch a movie, because you immediately identify the hero and you identify with him. It's like, he's the person that you're mythological imagination grasps onto and you play that out using your body as a representational platform when you watch the movie and so maybe you admire the hero if he's a successful hero you do well that admiration is the manifestation of the instinct that drives you towards that kind of behavior and not only can you manifest it in which case you're likely to feel good about yourself because you know that sometimes you can feel good about yourself and sometimes not but you're also going to be able to recognize it when you see it in the world. And that's going to manifest itself in admiration. And admiration is the proclivity to imitate. So the meme can be so... so. The, you can imagine, dominance hierarchies are very, very old. They're like 300 million years old. They've been around a very long time. And the idea that we have an image of what it takes to climb the dominance hierarchy, it's, it's more or less self-evident because that's the landscape that selected us. And at the same time, you know, the, the archetype, the pattern that propagates you up the dominance arc is also the same pattern that makes you attractive to women. They're the same thing. So, and of course, that's a massively powerful selection mechanism. First of all, men consciously choose who's going to lead them, at least in part, you know, who's going to succeed in a hierarchy. And women consciously choose their sexual partners. So the idea that the selection process, that the evolutionary process is random is, it's an absurd proposition. Sexual selection makes it non-random.